Hello, members of the Comparative and International Education Society. My name is Adam Roberti, and I'm the director of Cortada Projects here at Pinecrest Gardens in Miami, Florida. I'm here to introduce to you your 2020 plenary speaker, Xavier Cortada. Xavier Cortada is professor of practice at the University of Miami Department of Art and Art History. The crux of Cortada's work finds itself rooted in a deep conceptual engagement of his participants. Particularly environmentally focused, the work Cortada develops is intended to generate awareness and action towards the issues of global climate change. The artist has exhibited and produced works internationally, including in Antarctica, Bolivia, Canada, Cyprus, Holland, Northern Ireland, Panama, Peru, South Africa, Switzerland, Taiwan, and the North Pole. Cortada's work is in the collections of the Perez Art Museum, the NSU Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale, the Whatcom Museum, the Patricia and Philip Frost Art Museum, the MDC Museum of Art and Design, and the World Bank. Cortada, who was born in Albany, New York, of Cuban refugee parents and grew up in Miami, holds undergraduate, graduate, and law degrees from the University of Miami. Xavier Cortada. Hold your applause. Thank you so much, Adam. I really appreciate you uh, doing that. It's, uh, it's uh, humbling to be uh, before 3,500 of my uh, fellow colleagues uh, at this conference and at this time. It's obviously an extraordinary time for us here. Uh, you know, here in Miami, we uh, close our schools down. Um, have all of our retail, uh, non-essential retail closed. We, we, we were basically paralyzed as we try to deal with this pandemic that, uh, as we speak, keeps on contaminating and infecting our, our society and bringing all sorts of havoc. And I am uh, humbled that each of you uh, are taking time to listen to me during this time. Uh, originally, our conference, well, it still is our conference team, is educating beyond the human. And I, I think in, in so many ways, now more than ever, as we stare down this pandemic, a pandemic that may change the way we think about each other, but also the way we interact with one another, and hopefully, through our collective work as educators, how we create a new world, a world that is going to be responsive to those not yet born, responsive to those who suffer the most today. In so many ways, um, the plenary that I am delivering, <laughs> plenary that was addressing uh, the invisible, what we know but fail to see, is now presented to you with everything apparent, with a stock market that has collapsed by 35%, with tens of thousands of Americans infected, with hundreds already dead, and without an understanding of how this will end. In so many ways, the future that we feared because of the human impacts on climate, the future that we feared because of a society be built based on, in too many ways, arrogance and greed, because the future that we feared for our great-grandchildren is here with us today and now. And it is in that context that I present you with this plenary. So let me go ahead and get started. <clears throat> we are pioneers and runaway slaves and political refugees making new home in a strange place built on water with hurricanes and more. We've witnessed destruction and loss, but now face our greatest challenge. The water is rising and it will not recede. We must summon courage, 
share wisdom with those who will follow. We must tell them who we are. We must explain what we saw. We must show them how we responded. We must help them navigate the greater chaos to come. We must write it all down, seal it in an envelope for them to read later. But tell them not to open it for a hundred years or perhaps half the time if you think they can't wait that long. Or maybe sooner, in 25 years, when everyone will accept that the problem is real. They'll listen to us then. They'll finally understand. We will all unite as Antarctica comes to town. Or tell them do not open for 200 years when they will yearn most to hear from those of us who once walked upon the land. This picture here is a picture of the McMurdo Dry Valleys. Scientists travel to this site in Antarctica every year to see how small changes in climate have profound effect on that ecosystem. That frozen lake there has different strata. Strata that hold different organisms, different microorganisms. Among those is this photosynthetic specialist, UW0241. And that microorganism is important for scientists to study because in a world where nine out of 10 crops a decade from now will reduce their productivity by 20%, we need to see what biology is doing beneath that frozen ice at extreme weather in a changing climate so that we can learn how we can, in our current state, feed the planet. I'm part of that collaboration. When I was in Antarctica, back in 2006 and 7, they provided me with some samples of the sediment from that very location that I used to create these Antarctic ice paintings. I also spoke to glaciologists, other scientists in Antarctica who informed me that the very ice that I was standing on threatened to melt and drown this city. At that moment, my path as an artist took a new focus, a laser focus. I took that ice, I melted it, I combined it with the sediment from the dry valleys. And in many ways, I created these art pieces I call the Antarctic ice paintings that are a precursor of the horrors to come. And I showcased them, I showed them to political leaders, I exhibited them in museums and galleries and in alternative spaces to let our community understand that due to the human impacts on climate change, due to the addiction that we have to fossil fuels, every place on earth where land touches water would be impacted by rising seas. And that would create catastrophic effects, not just for people living at the water's edge, but for all the ecosystems impacted by that change. I took those ice paintings, literally paintings made with melting glacier water, paintings I created in Antarctica, about Antarctica, with Antarctica, and in 2018 here in my community, I used them as a backdrop for a campaign of yard signs that I created. It was called the Underwater Homeowners Association. And what I intended to do through that project was to make sea level rise something impossible to ignore. Right here from my studio at Pinecrest Gardens, I began an effort where through an app, people were able to visualize the elevation of their properties. And using that app, they would know how many feet above sea level their home stood. I did so because too many thought that the problem 
only matter to those at the water's edge, but by placing yard signs all over these neighborhoods with the elevation of those homes, I began to map the topography of my city. A city, unlike many of yours, that is doomed because beneath our feet we have oolite, limestone, porous rock that cannot prevent the water from rising. And through this campaign, we're able to let individuals know that they needed to start acting now to protect their future. Here in South Florida, whenever there's a hurricane, everyone responds to it. Everyone puts their shutters up, they buy their supplies, they make sure that everyone in the community is taken care of, that those who are frail, those who cannot be cared for after the hurricane hits are taken to shelter. Those living at low elevations do not stay at home. We all worry about a problem that we can see coming, a problem that will leave the second the storm's eye passes through us, a problem that for the most part all of us have insured for, but we fail to see the bigger problem the fact that the water will rise and it will not recede and that will impact ecosystems, that it will impact economies, and it will impact the most vulnerable, especially those who aren't aware that they're in dangerous path. So as an artist, as a social practitioner, I create processes like the Underwater Homeowners Association to let individuals understand that. This picture here showcases what Miami can look like by the year 2100. The areas in darker blue are neighborhoods, people's homes that will be inundated with that elevation of water. And what I wanted to do through this process is help people understand that Miami had two coastlines, not just the obvious coastline at the Atlantic Ocean, but also the Everglades was our second coastline. That the neighborhoods on the western part of our urban core, the neighborhoods on the western part of our county, the ones closest to the Everglades, that ones that were built out with development stretching out westwardly, were, at, were as if not more vulnerable because unlike the wealthy neighborhoods at the water's edge, neighborhoods that have the tax base to begin to adapt, that have residents with the wherewithal to diversify their economic portfolios, that have residents who have multiple houses and an opportunity to perhaps mitigate against destruction to come, those living on the western part of the community have their entire life worth tied up in an equity of a house that could go underwater financially before the water laps to the shoreline. So by creating processes that bring people together so that they can learn together as a homeowners group to not plan what happens to your curb today, but what happens to your life and the inheritances of your children in the future was what was behind this project. I went to the North Pole in 2008 as a New York Foundation for the Arts sponsored artist. I went there in an icebreaker. And I remember all of us on the icebreaker being so shocked that the icebreaker got to the North Pole in record time. This was June of 2008. I created this ice painting just like I did in Antarctica. Uh, but on an icebreaker on the return from the North Pole using ice from the North Pole. If I wanted to go to the North Pole a decade from now, it is very likely that in June of 2030, I wouldn't need to get on an icebreaker in Murmansk and chop my way across the Arctic. Because in all likelihood, 
the Arctic will have ice-free summers. And if you can, for one second, understand the catastrophic effects of an ice-free Arctic, the catastrophic effects, not just in extreme climate, the jet stream that goes across the northern parts of our planet, but how the melting of Greenland how the melting of the permafrost across the Arctic Circle would bring feedback loops that are catastrophic to our existence. How the Gulf Stream could be weakened. How methane would be released from the permafrost. A greenhouse gas 20 times more damaging to us than carbon dioxide. If we could for a second understand that because of our inability to address the issues of fossil fuel, greed, and transition into a clean economy, and think about future generations and ecosystems in our planet, because of our ways of thinking that somehow can't be moved, we will do unthinkable harm to populations, if we just for a second understood what an ice-free Arctic would, would mean, we would act as urgently as we have in the last two weeks to address the coronavirus pandemic. Because the impact to humanity and ecosystems and our world is more profound, and I posit irreversible if we continue on this path. When I was in Antarctica, my studio was a lab in the area where the marine science labs were. And there was a tank that had a fish that scientists were studying because they had glycoproteins that would keep the temperature of the fish lower than the sub-zero temperatures of the sea surrounding it. That was an evolutionary process that took about 10 million years to evolve so that the fish could exist in that habitat in Antarctica. At the North Pole, there's an Atlantic cod that has the same capability so that it doesn't freeze in sub-zero temperatures of salt water in the Arctic. But that particular evolutionary process only took two million years, and it was a completely different species, completely different molecular processes. But what happened at these two places, at the Arctic and the Antarctic, and it happens all over the world, is the magic and the beauty of life on this planet as a rhythm, as a process, as a dance that since time immemorial has been creating and sustaining life on this planet. We as a species were part of that process when we evolved into the humans that we are today several hundred thousand years ago in the plains of Eastern Africa. And little by little, as we all know, we left the branches on those trees and started populating this planet with the rhythm of nature, literally. If there was a drought, our civilization would not be able to sustain there. If there were rains, we would hunt and gather in that direction. And little by little, we populated the entire planet, every place but Antarctica, a process that took about 200,000 years. And somehow, I think we have lost our way. Somehow, I think we forgot that we share the same nucleotides, the same nucleotides in our DNA that every thing that has lived, lives, or will ever live on planet Earth 
chairs. We were so good at evolving systems and processes in agriculture and technology presently that we forgot that we share the same biology that allows viruses to jump from bats to humans, from pigs to humans, from chickens to humans. We forgot that monoculture that we have used to replace healthy forests is something that we do at our peril because if those monocultures are impacted, then we have nothing to replace them with. We have forgotten that our excess greed for fossil fuels has put our plant, planet's future in peril by warming it. And it was during the Paris talks that I created a project called CLIMA to invite individuals to begin to understand the importance of our connection to nature. Through CLIMA, uh, through the 12 days of those Paris talks, I had different scientists and policymakers come to a center in Hialeah, one of our urban majority Hispanic municipalities, fourth, fifth largest municipality in Florida, just in the northwestern part of our county. I created an art exhibit sharing the art as a way of inspiring people. And then I created these 12 panels with scientists and policymakers to educate them. And then had these processes, participatory processes, performance art processes, to engage them in the art making as a way of helping them understand issues like property value and how that would impact the tax base. We talked about vectors of disease, how as global, as, as global warming happened, the tropics would continue moving northward and impacting our vulnerability to diseases that didn't live at these latitudes north of the tropics. We talked about agricultural productivity. We even talked about heat stroke and how climate change was not something that just impacted you a few decades from now with sea level rise, but presently by having the hottest summers on record year after year after year in this past decade. But extreme weather, we have endured in the state harsher and harsher hurricanes. And as the waters get warmer, stronger and stronger category five hurricanes will impact us until a point where the storm surges will make us so vulnerable that people may not want to invest in our communities any longer. And of course, we talked about ecosystem collapse, how our pollinators are disappearing, how our coral reefs are bleaching, and how we will suffer their loss. We also talked about green energy and the possibility for educators to impact future societies. We talked about local action and advocacy. And all of these processes were made so that we could visualize a stronger future. And as educators, as thinkers who are here at this conference to try to see how we can, in face of what we knew was coming and also in face of what is here now, create new methodologies, new ways of teaching, new ways of engaging, new ways of communicating the science so we could have a cadre of individuals that are better prepared to respond. Like you, I am painfully aware of our challenges. So many are in denial. So many say, I'll be dead by then. In fact, even when we present the disease in front of them, even when we show them the impact of coronavirus, there are so many who deny it. There are so many who exploit it today. There are so many who act in the most inappropriate ways in face of the catastrophe in front of the disease. There are so many young individuals who refuse to take responsibility 
to protect themselves because somehow they think that they are not impacted. Because we have a society that still thinks of itself as individualistic and not part of a whole. I wholeheartedly understand how hard your work is. And my hope is that through this conference, through the posters, through the plenaries, through the interaction that we will be having, in light of the fact that the invisible future is visible and present now, that we will work together and learn together to think how we can deliver a better future to the present. How we can create policies thinking of those not yet born and thinking of the animals that we co-evolved with. And to try to get my community to think about that, I created this process called Do Not Open. It's the poem that I started with. A poem inspired by some elderly in that community of Hialeah that I had just spoken to you about. These are elderly who were Cuban refugees. They came here, as my parents did, fleeing Castro's revolution, an external force that changed life as usual in the blink of an eye. So everything you thought was secure, now wasn't secure anymore. And they came here with nothing. Part of the communist regime that Castro brought took everything away, nationalized all businesses, and had people who wanted to flee as refugees be forced to leave everything behind. So bank accounts were frozen, assets were taken away, homes became part of the the communist government. And these individuals came to the United States seeking freedom and built new lives as factory workers working two, three jobs as immigrants. And they did so with incredible industry. And they built this Miami that I'm in here today. And I asked them to think about climate as another external force that could befall them. Just like Castro took away their grandparents' property, their properties, climate change, sea level rise, could take away their current properties and all of its value. So I asked them to share their wisdom with us. I asked these political refugees to write letters to future climate refugees. Because this community has been built by those trying to find a better life and rebuilding their world. Business as usual ended so many of my fellow Miamians in Haiti with a dictatorial Haitian regime. So many Nicaraguans ended for my fellow Miamians with the Sandinistas. Today, life as usual ended for so many Venezuelans as their economy and their country and their political system and their environment today falls into disarray and they built new lives here. So we Miamians have a DNA that knows how to do this. And I wanted these elderly who succeeded in doing this to write their words down and I asked them to share those words for their great-grandchildren when it was time for them to do what they did, to leave it all behind and move away. And that inspired me to create the Do Not Open piece. And the purpose of Do Not Open is to create empathy, to have you understand that life is more than the 99 years that you're in or that what lives inside of your being, that you are part of a bigger story, a story beyond humans, a story about life on this planet, that you are interconnected to every organism on planet Earth that has ever lived, that you have a duty to care beyond yourself and the needs of your immediate family. That 
you're more than just citizens of the world, something I would love for us to understand. That you are beings who share this world with all other beings and that have a responsibility not to be co-conspirators in the sixth mass extinction, who have a shared responsibility to protect our planet from the destruction of wilderness that causes so many of these diseases that jump from humans to humans from animals in the wilderness. That we have a responsibility to leave this world better than how we were born into it. And that only comes with awareness and do not open was my way of lengthening that care horizon because if you could name the future, if you could write a letter to someone who was born in the year 2100 and who would open that letter as a junior in college in the year 2120. And if you could write a letter to that boy or girl, that young individual, and let them know who you were, what you saw, and why it is that you are writing to them, then words like, I'll be dead by then, don't matter. Then words like, it's not my problem, ring hollow. So do not open is this artist's way of trying to engage the community to write a letter that no one alive today will ever read. And I do care about the ears of 2120. I do care about that child who will be born at the precipice of a catastrophe. But I care more about you speaking those words. I care more about you understanding that there is someone who is going to be impacted by your actions and especially by your failure to act. Those letters that have been collected in Do Not Open are going to be opened at a time when scientists predict conservatively that we will have dumped 300 to 5, 300 gigatons, conservatively, 300 gigatons of carbon into our oceans. The number, some say, is closer to 500 gigatons if we continue at this pace. I don't need to remind you that we have put more carbon in the atmosphere this year than we did the year we signed the Paris talks, that we haven't changed anything, that we are still on this course to two degrees and three degrees and four degrees Celsius. That kid in 2120 who opens that letter will open it in a world where we have dumped 300 to 500 gigatons of carbon into our waters. Scientists at MIT looked at the five prior mass extinction events. Each of those had 310 gigatons of carbon. The kid who opens that letter opens it at the precipice of a catastrophe, smack in the middle of a mass extinction. It will take tens of millions of years before this planet gets the kind of biodiversity and ecosystem services that we are throwing away today because of the greed of one species in this planet in the last 100 years. This coronavirus motivated us to act as never before because we saw the clear and present danger. We saw people dying. What will it take for us to understand that there's a impossibly larger danger 
with us today and we still refuse to act. What will it take? It will take you. It will take these 3,500 educators from every country across the planet to change the way we think and to make a more compassionate, engaged, and loving human being. It will take that. It will take courage. Courage like you have never seen before. It will take a desire to do something to change systems and to fight for it. And it will take compassion. It will take an endless amount of compassion. All of us have an incredible amount of knowledge. It is what we have devoted our lives to do. Clearly, you are not sitting in front of me today because you are at your computers, because the virus that is impacting our community today is impacting you, your neighborhood, your family, your city, your country today. So we're communicating via an online platform. Using this online platform that's, that the conference has prepared for us, I'm inviting you to please share your wisdom. Share your wisdom in a letter to the future, except it's an open letter. It's not a letter for that child in 2120, even though you're directing it to them, to read. It's a child, it's a letter to be read by anyone who goes to the same blog that you're gonna be posting your letter in and wants to read it. Let's please have your words disseminate the knowledge, share the information that you have with others. And through this conference, a conference that now has been extended through the end of April, I will use those words to create an art piece to capture this moment in time. This was a conference to speak, beyond humans. To speak to humans not yet born, to speak to non-humans. In so many ways, I think this conference is also an invitation to speak to ourselves, an invitation for us to look inside, to be introspective, to understand our place and our role in this world at this time. To be alone with our thoughts and to realize the potential within each and every one of us to make a difference. It has been my true honor to be with you, to share with you in this conference. I thank you so much for listening and I look forward to working with each and every one of you, the 3,500 academics, thinkers, policymakers, members of the organization over the next six weeks in this discourse, in this dialogue, as this pandemic unfolds to see if collectively we can develop a new way of thinking and a new way of being. Thank you so much. Xavier, are, are there any questions? Oh, thanks. I didn't, even, I didn't even think about that. Thank you so much, Adam. Appreciate that. <clears throat> sure. Well, may I add to that, what do we tell our children about this time? In other words, what do we choose to remember and what do we choose to forget about this moment? Oh, no, the, the question was, uh, how do we reconnect and what do we uh, tell our elderly? And I, I said, sure, aside from 
that, I'd like to also add, well, what do we tell our children? And not just our children today, but those children not yet born. And I, I think, I think this, is, this is one of those moments that defines us, defines how we responded and how we acted. So what do we tell our children? I think we tell them the truth. I think we tell them the truth. I think we tell them that at the time of crisis, everyone bought up all the masks. <laughs> I think we tell them that everyone was so worried about themselves that they forgot that this was a pandemic where making sure that everyone was safe would guarantee their safety. I think you tell them that too many people didn't respond quickly enough from the top of our government all the way down to citizens who refuse to believe, who refuse to be responsible. I think we tell them the truth and we tell them that there will be pandemics more severe than this one, more contagious than this one, more infectious and more fatal than this one. We tell them that we tried and let's, let's see who we are. Let's see how this resolves itself by our action or inaction. Let's see how we choose to keep social distance. Let's see how we choose to pressure our elected officials to build a new reality when we come out of this pandemic. I say we tell the elderly, but also the children, the truth. The good news is we're early on in this conversation so that the story we share is one we're proud of sharing. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I'll take it from you. In other words, at this time of reflection, who are we as people? And I think it's similar to that conversation. Who are we as a people? What, what are our priorities? What do we value? So many uh, people on social media are talking about how they're finally being more aware, more self-aware, understanding what matters, understanding that in so many ways they've been on this treadmill, not understanding their connection to one another, to themselves, to each other. So, yeah, will this change us? Has it transformed us? I, I hope so. I know for one, all of us as educators are gonna have new uh, ways of teaching and sadly none of us really know um, when we're actually going to be able to go back to the classrooms. We're all doing online courses now. But, yeah, I think there will be some transformations. There are some things that will change. Um, but I hope what changes, changes the most is our hearts. I hope that the fear that we have now does not, as in other pandemics, evolve into xenophobia or hate, finger pointing, hoarding. I, I hope that the fear, that the obvious and important fear that we have now, manifests itself as a really loving and supportive and caring group of people. I think that is how I hope that we learn from this pandemic and transform ourselves. Yeah, up there, no, no, not, the next one's here. Okay. No, that's, uh, so the question was, how do we live, how do we, how do we live with ourselves, I guess is what you're saying. How do we live with ourselves after making decisions on who gets to live and who gets to die? And obviously I think you're referencing some of the decisions that we've seen in other nations as the hospitals meet, reach capacity and there aren't enough ventilators and there aren't enough individuals um, to care for the sick. And there's a triage moment where you have to make a decision that this particular life is 
worth saving and that one isn't. And what an impossible decision to make. But I'd like to posit that it's a decision that we make all the time, a decision that we make every day, a decision that we make as we decide to use fossil fuels is a decision that we make as the Amazon burns. It's a decision we made last August as the Amazon was burning, as we continue growing our food industries in ways that are not sustainable, as we continue developing into the wilderness, hunting, poaching, destroying ecosystems, not even understanding what we're destroying, the medicinal properties, the life-giving properties of the plants the destruction of the animals and the ecosystems that sustain life on this planet. I, I posit that what appears to be as an impossibly difficult act, deciding which sick patient lives and which one dies, is something that we do every day through our policies, through healthcare systems where not everyone has access to healthcare, through educational systems that do not deliver education equally across the board. I posit that we do, through our actions and inactions, decide every day. But maybe this pandemic, this moment like no other moment anyone in this country, the United States, has endured before, may make us think differently about these, about these things. Yeah? Well, how do we hold governments more accountable? Well, governments respond to people. So, I mean, they should. Obviously, uh, we have some structural issues that we need to handle, but even those structural issues are there because we as people allow them to be. I do believe that democratic systems can um, self-regulate, can from the body politic change things. So how do we hold ourselves more accountable? By giving permission to those policymakers to lengthen that care horizon. We hold ourselves more accountable by ensuring that we elect people into public office who, through their legislation, promulgate the values that we care about. We, we hold our governments more accountable by insisting that they do our will. And by making sure that special interests that control the louvers of government are curtailed so that our voices can rise. And again, that requires an incredible amount of courage, tantamount to that young man standing in front of the tank in Tinian Square. We need to stand in front of the tanks and ask for our government to be more responsive, more equitable, and have a longer care horizon if we care about our children, our grandchildren, and the animals we co evolve. I guess I have time for one last, yep, yeah, go ahead. So the question is, how will this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, um, help us learn how to address other pandemics? Let me say that another way, what have we learned? What have we learned, right? Can I do that? What have we learned from this pandemic? I hope that we have learned humility. that an organism, a virus that has 27 kilobase pairs, has crippled our economy, has scared us into isolation, has fractured systems that we thought were solid because we thought we were unsurmountable, because we thought as humans, as the dominant species of this planet that has changed everything else, that we as the apex predator were totally in control. And we thought it was gonna stay that way. We thought that technology would continue to sustain us. And what we've learned is that we're only human. So my hope is that the way we face other pandemics 
is by understanding that in a world where so much of it is interconnected through travel and commerce, that there are no borders, that there are no boundaries, that different classes and people with wealth are impacted differently, but at the end of the day, all of us are impacted and that we need to create structures and systems and processes that are aware of our vulnerability and that we work collectively using our wisdom, wisdom that we learn together as we work together to march forward to a brighter future. I know that we will get through this pandemic. There'll be immeasurable suffering and loss. But if we do not learn from this pandemic that we are part of life's beautiful dance, that we are part of the shared biology of this planet, and that every action we take impacts our planet, if we don't learn that from this biological threat that we face now, then we do so at our peril. Hey, it's, it's been really wonderful to, to spend time with you. I know we have six weeks of conversations and interaction, and clearly we have a lifetime of fellowship as we work together to effectuate some change. Let's hope that this pandemic opens some eyes and allows us to walk to take us there. Again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm humbled, truly humbled by being your plenary speaker. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks.